Hello campers. Welcome back to Girls Camp. I'm your host, Haley Rawl. So happy you are here. I'm in a wonderful mood right now. I was reflecting on past intros and I feel like I've always been kind of somber and a little introspective when doing my intros for some reason. And for whatever reason today, I'm feeling great. I actually just had an interview. I did an interview for an episode that will come out the week following this episode with my friend Bria Lee. She is so phenomenal and I'm feeling so enlightened by her, so inspired, so motivated. So that's part of why I'm feeling so stoked. I have my Diet Coke. It's a Sunday. It's nice to have a Sunday back as we all know and I'm just feeling good. You can probably tell my Prozac has kicked in and I'm feeling a lot more like myself and I'm really excited for today's episode. We are doing an unfiltered, uncensored Q&A. I am going to be as unfiltered and as uncensored as I can possibly bear. I was reading through some of these questions that were written in last night. There's a couple that I was like, hmm, is now the time to actually talk about this thing? It's nothing insane, but I don't know. I'm kind of in the mood to share all, to spill the tea as it were. So I think I'm going to get into a lot of things and there's just a lot of really good, fun, thought-provoking questions. This kind of shit is my favorite thing to do. I'm one of those people who is so obsessed with any type of personality test. I love answering questions. I just think it's a really interesting way to take a look at your own brain and analyze what's going on up there. And so just getting a bunch of really thoughtful, good, thought-provoking questions is the best thing ever. And I can't wait to dive in. I am not going to do a campfire chat today because I feel like this whole episode is kind of a prolonged campfire chat. Maybe I will title it Uncensored Campfire Chat, but we're kind of just chatting anyway today. So I think I'm just going to dive right into the questions. And like I said, who knows where this ride is going to take us. We're just going to be talking about all the Mormon, post-Mormon things. Okay, first question. This is kind of a deep one. Do you ever wish you had a different life, like wish you hadn't married who you married or when you married? Leaving the church has expounded my understanding of myself, and it has really made me wonder if this is what I wanted. I love this question. I think about this often. Short answer, do you ever wish you had a different life? Mm, Okay, I can't give a short answer. No, I don't wish I had a different life. That said, I do think that there has been a lot of grief and sometimes even regret around certain life decisions that I have made. I think I'm at a place now where I've kind of come to terms with why I made the decisions I made when I made them, and I'm happy with where I'm at now, but one of the biggest ones being getting married. In hindsight, I wish I did not get married when I was 20 years old. I wish that I waited a lot longer from meeting Bentley to marrying him. One of the things I always say is that I think Bentley and I would have ended up getting married, but I think we would have had a much easier marriage had we taken more time to get to know each other and to get to know ourselves also before we got married. But then it gets really complicated because maybe we wouldn't have married each other if we had waited longer to get married, you know? And if I wasn't Mormon, I certainly wouldn't have married him. I mean, not just because it's him, but I just probably wouldn't have gotten married at that phase of life. And so, you know, it's the domino effect. Everything in my life led me to where I am now. And because I am glad for where I am now, it's difficult to even say to even answer this question, but I do think there is so much room and so much space there should be for feeling real grief around being married, around having kids. You know, I look at people on the internet all the time who are my same age and they are getting a PhD or they are 
in the party scene or they are dating around. And I for sure have feelings come up all the time where I think, damn, that sounds really fun. (laughs) That kind of life sounds really nice and fun. And it doesn't mean I'm wishing my current life away. But I think that those feelings are not only fair and valid, but in some ways, I think even to be expected, especially when a lot of what got me to this point in my life is something I now no longer believe in. Very long, very convoluted answer, but essentially I think what I'm saying is it can be a both and. You can be really happy for the life you have and also have regrets and resentment toward what pushed you to make certain decisions that you've made. What was the and? I can't remember. You get what I'm saying, right? The only other thing I wanted to say on this is if you do legitimately at this phase in your life as a post-Mormon, if you're married or if you have kids and you think, I actually wish I didn't get married or have kids in the sense that you're not happy that this is where the Mormon church has led you, that's so fair too. I feel like me being happy where I'm at has also had a ton to do with luck. I think I got really lucky that I married someone and that we changed in similar directions. And that, in a lot of ways, was luck of the draw. I feel really lucky about the timing of having my twins. I think there's a lot of things that play into those circumstances. So if you find yourself feeling like this is not the life I would have chosen and I wish this wasn't my life, that is a very, very valid thing. And I'm really sorry. It's not something I can relate to necessarily, but I can absolutely understand how someone might feel that way. And I think that that would also probably increase a lot of the resentment that I would have towards the church too. Okay, next question. I know this is a delicate question, but I'm curious if there's any more kids in the plan. And I actually had quite a few questions about this. I know asking people about kids, having kids, having more kids is like a social no-no, which I think is a good thing, especially as someone who went through infertility, but I like talking about this, so thank you for asking. I do not plan to have any more kids. It's kind of an interesting thing because I was infertile for three years and so desperately wanted children. It was the only thing I could think about for a good long period of my life. Once I got pregnant with the girls and had the twins, I just felt complete. I think I've just felt really complete, and it feels like my family is complete. I don't know how else to describe it. I definitely think Part of that feeling is just the fact that I do not want to be pregnant again. I don't want to give birth again. I don't want to have newborns again. I'm very happy to have done all of that and have my children, but it's not something that I crave or want to do again the way I know a lot of parents do. So for me, whenever people ask this, I always say I am 90 8% sure (laughs) that I'm done. I also just feel really lucky to have twins because I feel like I got two babies in one go. I mean, I did get two babies in one go. Like I said, because I really didn't like being pregnant and it was a long, hard process to get pregnant and to be pregnant. I feel glad that we got two kids and I don't necessarily feel the need to have any more. Someone also asked me, not this specific question, but someone asked if I'm planning to have more kids and if that has changed post-Mormon. It's hard to say because by the time I had the girls, I was out of the church and I hadn't really thought about future kids beyond having the twins. So I don't know, but I wouldn't doubt that if I was still Mormon, there would be different considerations towards having more kids and maybe more pressure to do so. But I feel great and confident about if I decide to just have the two. Next question. Sativa or indica. These are strains of marijuana, for those who don't know. And I am a hybrid girly, but I like an indica dominant hybrid because you still feel kind of cozy, more tired. It's kind of like a nice body high, but it's not like you just want to go to sleep because of the hybrid nature. I like taking my marijuana by way of edibles. I'm all about the gummy. I like about a third of a 10 milligram edible if we're getting very specific. The specific strain I like is called Blue Dream. So there you go. That is my personal recipe. But I feel like with marijuana, it's just about trying different things and seeing what feels nice. And 
different strains work differently for different scenarios too. Also, I hope I'm not sounding so pretentious as I described that. I actually don't know that much about weed. My husband is the one who presents me with my options and then I just try different things. But that is what I have found to be my best case scenario for a weed experience. Next question. Have you removed your records or just decided that it isn't worth it? I was talking with some friends about this the other day, and for a really long time, up until maybe a couple months ago, I did not want to remove my records. I talked about this on Instagram once where I posted a story and I was kind of DMing with a lot of you about how we feel about removing records and keeping records, and there's a lot of opinions about it. For me, there is just obviously something about removing records that feels so final, And it's funny because I have a full-blown post-Mormon podcast and even still didn't want that permanence or finality of removing my records. As of the past couple months, I am all of the sudden like almost a switch flipped in my brain where I'm like, I cannot believe my records are still part of the church. I cannot believe my name is being counted by church headquarters as a member and I really want to remove my records. I have not got around to it, but I had an idea. I don't necessarily know how it works. I think there's now like a website you can use called quitmormon.org where you can just do it all online, but you might have to get something notarized in person. I'm not sure, but I was thinking it could be so fun because I know a lot of us want to remove our records, but we just haven't gotten around to it or haven't had like a reason to. I was thinking it would be so fun to get a group together and go do it. If you have to do something in person, like get something notarized to all go as a group, or maybe just to like get together and bring our laptops and just like all sign up to remove our records. (laughs) I don't know. It just sounds fun to make that experience more of a thing. I feel like removing records is kind of anticlimactic because you just submit whatever you need to and say, take me off the records and quietly they do. So it sounds fun to make it more of a celebration where I'm at in my journey. It sounds like a fun, exciting step to feel very, very ready for that permanence and finality in stepping away from Mormonism. I also wanted to mention with this, I know some people's considerations because I was talking with a good friend of mine with removing records is that they worry that their parents will be notified. You know, if you're in the LDS app or whatever, then your parents can see that you've removed your records, I think. So I completely understand that consideration. That's not really a consideration for me, but I also know there are some of you who would love to remove your records, but you're kind of balancing some of that. So just wanted to say, I get that. The whole record removal thing, I don't know. I see all sides of it. I am starting to feel, like I said, crazier and crazier that my name is still being counted amongst members of the Mormon church when I'm so obviously not. But just keeping your name on the records to keep the peace in your family, I absolutely understand that. The symbolism of removing your name from the records can be really huge. And for some people, it's just kind of like, I've left. It doesn't really matter to me if I'm officially counted or not. But I still get emails from a ward I was in like three wards ago. I get Relief Society updates and emails and I've emailed them and said, please take me off the list. I'm not in this ward anymore. And they won't because I actually think my records are still in that ward. And when I say three wards ago, I actually mean three homes ago because I think that's where our records got stuck. And so anyway, if you remove your records, then they can't keep sending you church emails and contact you, which is kind of nice too. Okay, next question. This is a really good question and it has had me thinking a lot. I read this last night and I've been pondering a lot on kind of what came up for me. What are your thoughts on quote, anti-Mormons, those who just tear the church down? When I read this, I was thinking about what I do here at girls camp and kind of my aims and kind of 
what I try and be about in the ways that I speak about the church and I speak about leaving the church. And I think already over a short course of this podcast, that has kind of shifted and changed and changed back. It's not a static thing. It's changing as I change and depending on my mood and what's going on. Basically, what I think is that there is a space for everyone. And there are certain people who talk about Mormonism publicly who I don't necessarily resonate with the way that they speak about it. And not even because they're, quote, tearing the church down, but just because something about the tone or attitude just doesn't speak to me, period. I think what's been a really healthy practice for me is seeing people who speak about it in a way, again, that doesn't resonate and realizing, oh, but this resonates with a whole lot of other people. There's nothing wrong about it. It's just different. And being in the post-Mormon space now, I think anyone who talks about this publicly has a different flair, has a different kind of aim, maybe. I think that's wonderful because there's so many post-Mormons, there's so many post-religious people or people just interested in the space that obviously people are going to find the creators. That feels like such a crazy word. (laughs) People are going to find the people who they connect with. So to me, it's been very nice to, I guess, just find neutrality and not necessarily say, oh, they seem harsh or intense or angry and therefore it's wrong, but understanding they're just doing it in a different way. And I think we're all basically working toward the same thing, which is to help people who are questioning the church or people who have left the church. Different people are gonna like different ways of doing that. Next question. Is there anything or any way the church could change to make you go back? No, not one thing. I cannot imagine going back to the Mormon church, and I can't really imagine even at this point joining any other sort of organized religion at all. And I think the reason for that is that so often, I know a lot of you will relate, and I know not everybody relates, but I think it just speaks to the way that leaving Mormonism kicks off a chain of deconstruction where for me, I deconstructed Mormonism. I started to deconstruct Christianity. I no longer identify as Christian. I then kind of start deconstructing just organized religion in general. And for me, those things just don't really hold value for me anymore. While I still consider myself a spiritual person and am open to finding communities for spiritual enlightenment and connection. I just don't ever see organized religion being a part of that. And I definitely do not see the Mormon church ever being a part of that. Even if the church became like the best spiritual haven ever, that was completely unproblematic, which is just never going to happen. There's too much baggage there, right? I would just find a different church. Saying that actually just reminded me of something I've wanted to share with you all. This might not seem like a revolutionary thought, but it kind of clicked something really important in my brain. So take it for what you will. But I was talking with my friend Tanner and we were talking about the fact that there are a lot of Mormons who are in the Mormon church and they say, I'm a Mormon, I identify as Mormon, but I completely disagree with the Mormon church's stance on LGBTQ issues, for example. Or they'll say, I'm a Mormon, I identify as a Mormon, but I also drink alcohol and I don't believe in the word of wisdom. And as I was talking about this with Tanner, I had the thought that in any other religion or in a lot of religions, If you were part of the religion and then the religion was teaching something that you didn't agree with, it would probably make sense that you just find another religion that better suits yourself and your needs and your morals and your values. What makes less sense to me is that you would say, I completely disagree with this thing that this religion is telling me is really important but I'm gonna stay in the religion anyway. That's one of the things that makes me feel like Mormonism has a cult element to it because people don't feel like they can leave. Even if they disagree 100%, 
even vocally with pieces of it, they still feel like they need to stay as opposed to just going to find another religion that, again, suits them better. And I don't mean to be overly simplistic because obviously if you're Mormon, usually the reason that you're staying in Mormonism, even if you disagree with a lot of things, is because you believe in like the core core doctrine. So you believe in Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, and therefore you think the religion has the priesthood power of God, and you can believe those things, and you can maybe find a way to say these other things might just be a little wrong, or they might have just gotten it not quite right, but I believe in the core tenets of the religion, which are unique to Mormonism. But even still, it just feels like all of those things are so interconnected to me that to be willing to do the mental gymnastics and to go through the cognitive dissonance of saying, I still believe in Mormonism and the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith, even though they're completely wrong on this thing, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I'm saying all of this too, as someone who did that myself for quite some time, where I was a Mormon, I identified as Mormon, I wanted to stay Mormon forever, even though I said they're absolutely wrong on gay people. And then I started to say, I don't even think the word of wisdom is really that important. But part of me felt like I needed to stay. And I think it was because I felt like I was indoctrinated into thinking that was the only safe space for me. It was the only truth. It was the only way to be happy and to get to heaven, all of the things Mormonism says, instead of just saying, oh, now that I no longer believe in these pieces of this religion where you're supposed to believe in all of it for any of it to make sense, I can just go find another religion that brings me this peace and safety and you know, a path towards heaven, but doesn't have these pieces that I don't believe in. So that was kind of an interesting new like thought light bulb moment I had around Mormonism and why I think progressive Mormonism can feel frustrating or confusing. And even though, again, I've been in that stage too, I think it makes me see progressive Mormonism much more as an outcome of a church that doesn't allow people to feel like they can safely step away and just find other frameworks that suit their beliefs better. Next question, what is your dream career? My dream career is to be a podcaster. <laughs> um, no, it really is. I was searching for a long time for my dream career. And I work as a project manager. That's my day job. I kind of stumbled into project management right out of BYU. And it was always and still is a job that I enjoy to a certain extent. I think it has a lot of things about it are things that I'm good at and that don't require a ton from me, if that makes sense. It's not creative. It's kind of straightforward. And I enjoy being able to go to work and do what needs to be done and get a paycheck for it. But I always kind of had this sense inside of me that I wanted to do something more creative, more aligned with my passions. I always thought that that would be in the realm of writing because I studied literature and I love to write. I don't think I've talked about that much on the podcast, but I really love to write. I love writing poetry and I love writing personal like essay opinion pieces. But writing for me was always something that really quickly lost its savor when I did it for pay. So I tried, I kind of dabbled in copywriting, I dabbled in copy editing, just never felt like something I wanted to do day in, day out, and for money. And so I've stuck with project management, but since doing this podcast, I feel like I have found my passion. I love doing this. It doesn't feel like writing in the sense that I mean, it's difficult. I think it takes a lot for me sometimes energetically, but it feels very sustainable and it feels so much more accessible than writing ever felt. I think it's a lot more difficult to get people to read a long piece of writing than it is to get people to tune in to a podcast. So I really love this format for sharing my ideas. I really, really love interviewing, which I never really saw as being part of my ultimate career or passion. 
And so all of that to say, I hope to continue podcasting and to make it my full-time gig. I think there are also kind of podcast adjacent things that I could maybe go into as well. I also think it would be super, super cool to write a book somewhere down the line. That always feels like the most pretentious shit in the world to say, (laughs) Um, but I do like to write. I would love to find a way to tell my story or even other people's stories via writing, whether that's a novel or a series of essays or whatever it may be. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I just want to say it feels so fucking good to feel like there was this piece inside of me really searching for my thing. And this feels like my thing, at least for now. And that is such a gift to feel good about what you're doing and feel like it's your calling or whatever you want to call it. I hope to keep podcasting and to make it my career. Okay, there's a lot of sex questions, (laughs) like a lot of sex questions, sex and porn and just sexuality stuff. So I'm going to get into all of those in a minute, but I think I'm going to lump them all together. So stay tuned for that. But let's answer a few more questions first. Ooh, how about this question? What if Mormonism is true? I do not think that it is. But if I were theoretically to entertain the idea that it is, I really believe I'm to the point where if Mormonism were true and I get to the pearly gates and it's Mormon Heavenly Father and Mormon Jesus that await me there and they say, you were wrong, you had the truth and you got deceived by Satan or whatever, I would be like, well, you know what? I don't think I want to be in heaven with you anyway. And I don't like the system you created, and I don't like the rules you had, and I don't like the conditions you put on what it takes to get to heaven and to be in your presence. So I'm going to go hang out in the Telestial Kingdom because that's where I'd rather be anyway. (laughs) And I know that sounds crazy, but I really mean it. I am to the point where I just, if that's what it is, if there's a God and he's listening to me say this right now... And he's like, well, Mormonism's the way and she'll find out someday. I'm like, well, I'd rather be doing what I'm doing, which is fighting the system and fighting the power because that is not something I would want to buy into. It's genuinely not. Even if it is true, I don't want to buy into something that so goes against the core of what I think makes me feel peaceful and joyful and aligned and ultimately is just something that's exclusive. Like, okay, I get to heaven and Mormonism was true, and all my gay friends are just like, what? They go to the celestial kingdom? They turn straight? Like, no, we don't want that. I don't want any part of that. So I'm just not really that worried about if Mormonism is true or not, because I think it's not. And because if it is, then I don't want any part of it. Okay. What are your current spiritual beliefs? There were a lot of questions along these lines as well and kind of how I identify now spiritually. I would say loosely, I identify as an agnostic. I'm not quite atheist. I wouldn't even necessarily say I believe in God, but I do think I believe in some sort of higher power. I think I still believe there's some sort of afterlife too. I just don't know and I'm okay with not knowing. And I'm sure there will be phases in my life where I feel more compelled to have a little bit more, not even clarity, but to have maybe more solid answers around some of those things, not even answers, but to be able to not just say, I don't know, (laughs) you know, but for now, I feel pretty great about saying, I don't know, and having all the possibilities be on the table feels nice to me. I'm excited to continue exploring different spiritual ideas and different concepts of spirituality and try them on for size and see where I end up. That's why the agnostic label feels best to me right now. The way I speak about it, I know it's kind of ambiguous. It's kind of vague. That's not because I'm trying to hide anything from anyone. It's just because my beliefs feel very ambiguous and very vague and also changing. You know, I was listening to the What We Said podcast and JC, who's 
been on Girls Camp as well. She was talking about the concept of does everything happen for a reason. She was saying that even after she left the Mormon faith, I believe, she still believed everything happens for a reason. And now she's not so sure. And not being sure about that kind of was making her feel overwhelmed and it felt unmooring. And I related to that a lot because... There was a time where I was like, I'm not Mormon, but I do believe everything happens for a reason. And now I'm kind of in a phase where I'm like, I don't know. I kind of just think things happen. And it's our choice what meaning we make from series of events and from the things that happen to us or for us and the people around us. That can feel scary for sure. And it scares the hell out of me sometimes. And then other times it just feels like, I think that just is what it is. So all of that to say, I'm still figuring it out in a really big way, and I'm just taking it easy, letting myself take the time to figure it out, and not putting any pressure on having any specificity necessarily around my spirituality and spiritual beliefs. This is such a good question, this next one. Bentley, as he was helping me set up the camera and the audio, actually asked me, something along the lines of this. He was asking, do you think you're ever going to run out of content, like stuff to talk about as it relates to Mormonism, post-Mormonism? So I want to put a pin in that and first answer this question, and then I'll make my way back to Bentley's question. But this question says, I flip-flop between wanting to talk about Mormon stuff and wishing I never had to think about it again. Do you ever get sick of it or worry that you will? I'm not sick of it. I do worry that I will get sick of it sometimes, and I guess already going back to Bentley's question, I sometimes worry how much content there is to be made around Mormonism, how much there is to say about Mormonism, and then anytime I think of that, I feel like, hmm, I feel a lot of things. Speaking about the podcast specifically and talking about Mormonism on the podcast, I see Girls Camp definitely pivoting or expanding somewhere down the line, be that in five years or 10 years or six months, I don't know. But I think that there are so many Mormon adjacent or just religion, spirituality adjacent topics that girls camp could explore, right? Maybe I'll expand into just spirituality more generally and speak more about spiritual ideas and philosophies. Maybe I will start doing more investigative stuff where, you know, we do a 10 part series about MLMs and Mormonism and I do a lot of research and it's maybe a little more scripted and there's more interviews that are more of a NPR style kind of thing. I don't know. We'll see, but I think I don't really have that fear around the podcast just because I think there's so many different ways it could go. I think it will change eventually, but I don't really worry that I'll just like run out of things to talk about because if your girl's got one thing going for her, it's that she always has something to talk about. (laughs) And I can usually find a way, or it usually does just in some way, relate back to spirituality, Mormonism maybe, existence, which is spiritual in some broad sense. I'm just not that worried about it. So we'll see where Girls Camp ends up. As far as just talking about Mormonism, generally speaking, so not just for the podcast, Yeah, sometimes I definitely think, man, if I didn't start this podcast, I wonder where I would be with my faith deconstruction just because I wouldn't be talking about it as much. And it started to feel like my job to talk about it. And not only here on the podcast, but on social media. And now that I talk about it here and on social media, I end up talking about it a lot in real life as well with Bentley or with people I meet who, you know, know that that's what I talk about. And sometimes I do feel like, hmm, I hope I'm not miring myself. I don't know if that's actually even the right word. I hope I'm not putting myself in a situation where I'm just like going over and over and over and over it again, but I don't feel like I am. And I feel like that fear is more about a perception of me than it is about how I actually feel. And how I actually feel about talking about Mormonism in this capacity is that it reveals to me all the time the layers and the depth 
that all of this goes for me as a person and in my life. And I actually am really appreciative that I've talked about it because I think it's really put me in a position to see that and to see that all along this was all here. I always had a lot to dig into of all these different facets of the experience, but I don't think I would have unless I was doing this podcast. So it's kind of been a really cool reciprocal effect where I feel like I'm putting myself in a position to talk about it and then talking about it then helps me process and heal in ways that I didn't even realize I needed to. So that's where I'm at for now on this question, but we'll see, you know, like I said, maybe a year from now, I'll be so over the Mormonism thing and we'll just talk about spirituality generally, or maybe we'll delve into other religions and do different segments on all sorts of different religions, or maybe we'll just talk about cults. I don't know, but I'm excited to see. What is the craziest thing you've learned about the church since leaving it? I love this question. I wish I asked every interviewee this question. Who? Where to begin? It kind of depends in what realm we're talking. If we're talking history, if we're talking the fact that the church has a hundred billion dollars has felt somehow shocking to me, especially lately, even though we all made that discovery a while ago. One thing that's been kind of top of mind that feels really crazy to me is just learning more about Joseph Smith as a person, how steeped he was in folklore magic, and how much Joseph Smith and his life and his interests, such as folklore magic, really shaped Mormonism. It's just so interesting to me. It's not necessarily the craziest thing about Mormonism, but I find it really, really fascinating. And I find it fascinating how much the church has tried to distance themselves from the folklore magic origins of Mormonism and how much Joseph Smith was really into some kind of astrology style magic stuff, which honestly kind of makes me like him. I mean, no, I don't like Joseph Smith and that does not make me like him. But of all the things about Joseph Smith, I'm like, that's kind of cool. I guess it's cooler than a lot of the other stuff in my opinion. But that one's just more of a top of mind thing. I don't know if there was anything really historically or anything like that that was like, oh, that's so crazy. It was more just the impact of all of it at once. And there was so much crazy stuff that the impact of learning and continuing to learn crazy stuff feels crazy. Like it feels crazy to me that I, at this stage in my deconstruction, am continuing to find out crazy stuff about the church and not even really trying, but just like having conversations here and there, getting on TikTok. I'm like, damn, there's a lot of crazy to uncover. And that alone feels crazy. This question. (laughs) I was scrolling on the ex-Mormon Reddit page and saw a story about a couple that had sex on the temple grounds because they were experiencing infertility. Is this a thing that people are encouraged to do? Were you and Bentley ever told to do this? Oh my gosh. Speaking of discovering crazy things since leaving the church, this is one of them. No, I was never encouraged to have sex on the temple grounds in order to get pregnant as someone experiencing infertility. That's wild. I'm so curious now as to where this originated from, and I'm making a mental note to write down infertility as an episode topic because there's so much to get into with infertility and Mormonism, but this would be a very interesting segment of that episode because is this a thing? Let me know if you've ever heard of this. I've never heard of it. I don't doubt it, but whoa. Also, just such a weird, funny thing to think that God is not going to like bestow the gift of getting pregnant upon you unless you like go have sex on the temple grounds. And then he would be like, okay, since you were in geographical proximity to the temple, I will now put the baby inside of you. But if you had sex at home and prayed for a baby, like that just wasn't enough. Just weird. Kind of makes you see the loopholes in the systems of even prayer because it's like, why do I have to do certain things if God already knows what I want and if God would already want to give it to me anyway? Anyway, that's a whole different rabbit hole to go down, but no, Bentley and I did not have sex on the temple grounds. Speaking of sex, let's get into the sex stuff. 
There's nothing crazy, crazy, but this is the thing I was debating whether or not I should talk about it, and I think I'm going to talk about it. So here we go. So curious on your stance on porn, asks someone. Porn, <laughs> let's talk about it. I have been very hesitant to talk about pornography because it's just a controversial subject, and I think it's very laden with judgment, yes, but also there's a lot of very real, very valid ethical implications. And not only ethical implications, but implications on marriages and on healthy sexuality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I am no expert on those things. I am just a gal, and I've done a limited amount of research. I have done some research, but this would be a great topic to delve into with an expert, a sex therapist maybe. I will be on the lookout and we should have that conversation because many of you, many of us are curious about the porn thing. And I will say I do look at porn. <laughs> that's the crazy thing that I'm that's the tea that I'm spilling today. And my thoughts on pornography are, I would say, in some ways similar to my thoughts on drugs and alcohol and that stuff, which is that it should be used very thoughtfully and responsibly. And with pornography, an additional factor is it should also be used as ethically as possible because there is a lot of porn that is produced very unethically. It has a lot of connections to, you know, sex trafficking. A lot of times there's lack of consent, et cetera, et cetera. I think that if you are careful and thoughtful and viewing ethical porn and being communicative about it with your partner and being very honest about it with yourself, I think that in my opinion, or I should say in my experience, I have actually found it to be a very healthy, beneficial thing for me personally. And I feel a lot of shame around that for all the reasons that you know. I don't have to explain all of them. But one of the reasons I have felt some shame or even shyness around that is because I feel like there's a narrative with women specifically where women just are like, Ugh, porn, like, I, I don't ever want to look at porn. Like, it's so crazy and freaks me out or whatever, which is fine. And if you feel that way, that's fine. I think for me, Viewing porn has helped me to explore myself sexually and to learn myself sexually and honestly has helped me tap into the more sexual parts of myself. And that's what it's been for me. I also think it requires a lot of communication, a lot of boundary setting. And also, I want to say too, I know there's a lot of baggage around pornography, especially for us post-religious people. I know people have had a history of like porn usage that maybe makes it a good thing just to avoid, which I think is absolutely good if that's the case to have that self-awareness. And I would never want to advocate for it necessarily, but I don't know. I think we're adults and I think we can all be smart and responsible and communicative. And if we can be those things, then I don't think it's the big bad boogeyman that Mormonism has made it out to be. Woof. I'm going to try and keep that in the final edit. <laughs> you can tell it's like such a mental block for me to say that. And I think that says a lot about it anyway. You know, I think... With porn especially, it feels like people might just view me very differently and that feels like scary, but I just think that it's worth being honest about and it's worth being vulnerable about because as I found, if that's how I feel about it, I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel that way about it too, but maybe are nervous to admit it or feel like something's wrong with them because that's the case. And again, if you just think porn's the worst thing ever, I absolutely understand that too. There were also some questions about masturbation, which I will talk about now because that's very connected to the porn thing. I think masturbation, not even connected to porn, but just masturbation by itself is something that I actually would advocate for. Again, in a partnership, I think it does require communication and boundary setting. I think especially, again, for us post-Mormons who have so much around that, 
It can be really scary to masturbate yourself or to know your partner's masturbating, but I think that it is so important to figure ourselves out sexually in that way. It has been hugely important for me. It's been really important in my marriage and For Bentley and I, I would say it has only improved our sex life to allow each other that opportunity for self-exploration. I think the research definitely backs that up, that masturbation can be very, very healthy and a very good way to figure yourself out sexually and just can be a really nice thing to have pleasure with yourself for yourself. Amber talks a little bit about that in the episode with Amber, and I loved what she had to say about it. Another thing that's interesting for me around this is that I never, ever, ever looked at porn growing up, and I never masturbated growing up. It is something that I've come to at this point in my life. I know that there are a lot of you who have a lot of shame around those things from when you were a kid and you were being told it was the worst, most evil thing to do, but you were doing it. And there's just so much there that, again, I would love to get into with a certified expert on the matter, but those are just some of my thoughts on it. Speaking of sex, how often do you and Bentley have sex? Has the amount changed after leaving? I don't know. I feel like we kind of go in phases. This is an interesting question because I talk about this stuff with my friends all the time, and I feel like I've always had friend groups that were all very, very open with each other about sex stuff. It's been so nice to have that, and I so appreciate spaces where you can talk about sex in a way that isn't laden with shame, and I think I've learned a lot from my friends, and it just is like a nice thing to be able to talk about. I was at a bar the other night. We went to a trivia night and I was talking with a couple of my girlfriends about sex and masturbation. And it was just like such a fun conversation. And we were just saying how beneficial it is to be able to open up with other women about sex stuff. Anyway, how often we have sex. I just wanted to say that because I don't think this is a great metric. And I think for me, at least, I have sometimes heard of couples having like way more sex and it makes me feel really sad or really bad. And I I don't know. I don't even really know how I would answer this question because it totally depends on a lot of factors. But I would say I do think our sex life has drastically improved post-Mormon. And I think that has to do with personal sexual exploration, as I just mentioned. I think that has to do a lot with embracing my own sexuality and uncovering and working through layers of sexual shame and allowing myself to show up sexually the way that I actually want to without feeling all those layers of guilt and shame. And I think Bentley and I have just really gotten to know each other better. And I think obviously emotional intimacy can lead to more fulfilling sexual intimacy. And as we've navigated and deconstructed our faith, we've gotten to know each other on much deeper levels and that has allowed us to be more sexually intimate as well. Okay, that's enough of the sex talk. I really got into it there. I feel like I did, at least. And I always laugh when I think about that because, again, things that just feel so radical to admit as a post-Mormon woman are mostly just like run-of-the-mill, normal-ass shit for the rest of the world. But hey, I am a post-Mormon woman, so some of those things feel a little crazy to talk about. But I think that they're important things to talk about. I think that's a big piece of taking away the shame and the stigma and the taboo around these topics. And I want to be a part of that because I don't think the shame and stigma and taboo serve any of us, you know, Being sexually liberated is the way to go, and we're all working towards that. So hopefully some of that is not helpful, like me sharing that is going to help you necessarily, but I just think it's helpful to not have those things steeped in this weird shame and stigma. So there you have it. Re all things post-Mormon sex stuff. This is a fun random question. Who do you have pinned on iMessage? I have pinned on iMessage. Carly, my best friend Carly, my across the street neighbor, and we go to the gym every morning together. She's pinned. I have my group chat with my mom and sisters, my mom and two sisters, and Bentley. Those are my iMessage pinned people. Shout out to you all. Uh, Next question. If Bentley was still an active Mormon, would you still be together? This feels almost impossible to answer because 
because Bentley is Bentley, that is why he's no longer Mormon. Does that make sense? Like Bentley wouldn't really be Bentley if after everything we've gone through and I've gone through, he was still Mormon. I guess what I'm saying is I just can't imagine a world in which Bentley would still be Mormon. Do I think we would still be together if I'm imagining that world anyway? I don't know. I think it would be really hard. I do think it would be really hard because I think that a lot of the things that I love and admire about Bentley are the things that led him out of the church, if that makes sense. But that's not to say if you're in a mixed faith marriage that everyone should feel that way. Of course not. That's kind of just how I feel. So it's difficult to answer. Ooh, this one is fun. What was your favorite hymn? My favorite hymn was Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Tune Thy Heart to Sing Thy Praise. Tune My Heart to Sing Thy Praise. That's a good song. I really love Come Thou Fount. And I'm trying to think. I feel like there was another one I really loved. I don't know. The hymns, there's some really nice hymns, some really nice hymns that still get stuck in my head to this day. But when I went back to church for my cousin's homecoming a couple weeks ago, I couldn't help but think, so many of these songs are so meh. They're so monotone and just there's not really even a melody to them. So the good hymns really stand out. But I think that there could be a lot more good hymns if Mormon Church PR has tuned in to this episode of Girls Camp. What do you think about posting kids on social media? I follow Mom Uncharted on TikTok and took all pics off my profile because I didn't realize how dangerous it is. Mom Uncharted is an incredible follow. I would absolutely follow her. I definitely think there is a lot of ethical implications with using children in social media that is monetized. I think that posting children, generally speaking, is complicated and something to think about. It is something I feel like I've just kind of been procrastinating, really deciding what my boundaries are. I do my best to only show, I guess, my children as like a part of my life without like making them the main event of my social media, if that makes sense. I think that children definitely deserve privacy and there's a lot of things I would never post of my children, like them having tantrums and, you know, there's tons of stuff I don't post to my kids personally, but as my podcast grows and my platform grows, I think this question is ever more on my mind. And I do think that I will probably stop posting them except for on like a close friends story or just not posting their faces, which is like what Amber Filler Up does. I need to kind of just make up my mind on that. This is a good question to encourage me to think through that. But I would absolutely follow Mom Uncharted. She's phenomenal and talks all about this. Do you believe in the paranormal? Okay, I was talking about this with some friends the other night too. I'm going to put a pin in this because I'm going to do a banger of a Halloween episode. I'm so excited about it. We will tell all of your paranormal stories that are Mormon or religious adjacent and then we will talk about what we believe about the paranormal as post-religious people or just post-Mormon people, because I think that's a really fascinating topic. And I'm going to bring a friend on to kind of break that all down with me. So stay tuned. Okay, I think this is the last question I will answer. I'd love to hear how you reconcile Mormon culture with being post-Mormon, like BYU games and relating to someone who speaks about something Mormon, mission, garments, etc. I'm not sure how to navigate these Mormon culture questions and conversations that inevitably arise with active family and friends. I really loved this question because I've never really thought about this in this way, but I think that when I'm around active family and friends and we're talking about garments or the BYU game, I almost see it as, this is difficult to say because sometimes it can be triggering. It depends a lot, obviously, on how it's being talked about, you know, in what context or what specifically the thing is. But if it's something as simple as like a BYU football game, I love to just lean in and talk about the BYU football game and not have to make the BYU football game about all my Mormon shit and all my issues with Mormonism and with BYU, but just to be like, you know, my family supports BYU and they love football. So we can just talk about who won the game last night and are they doing well this year and who's the quarterback now. 
I think that it's been nice for me to be able to just kind of lean into those cultural elements of Mormonism. Or for example, I've had many times where I'm talking with my mom and sisters about garments and my sister's looking for a dress that works with garments. And part of me wants to be like, well, garments are oppressive and just take them off. But then I think, you know, I, this is part of their life and I'm happy to just participate and be like, oh, you know, this website has some great dresses that I think could work or like, I'll keep an eye out. I just think it's nice and good to not make everything like a need to make a point about something, I guess. And I've actually found it nice to be able to just have those conversations and be able to relate as who I once was or things I once did and not have to, yeah, I guess just make anything more of it. I feel like there's many conversations I have that I enjoy to an extent to just be able to talk about these things that I once was dealing with too. I think it's nice because I think it makes my family members feel safe to talk about the things on their mind as far as Mormon culture goes. And I'll talk about things that, you know, they don't relate to that are outside of Mormon culture and they do the same for me. So although I understand it can be triggering to an extent and I honor that for you, if that's how it feels for you, for me, it's kind of just been a nice thing that I don't really worry too much about. And it's been a way that I can still maintain a certain level of connection over Mormonism with my family, even though I'm on such a different side of it. Oh, this reminds me, there's one more question I wanted to answer around family. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, okay. Are you close with your parents? How does your family feel about your podcast slash open hate for the church? <laughs> I don't know why I thought the word hate was kind of funny in that context, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not publicly a fan of the church. That's for sure. I feel very lucky because I am close with my parents. My dad is not an active member of the church, nor his wife, who's never been a member, but my mom and stepdad are active and my sisters and brother are all active and I'm very, very close with my mom and sisters. My mom and sisters and I have actually been talking recently about doing an episode with the four of us, so my mom and my two sisters, and kind of talking about how we navigate that. They have been supportive, incredibly supportive of my podcast, and I think they've done a really good job at setting their own boundaries around if they listen and what they listen to, and we don't talk a ton about the content of what I do, but they are very supportive and asking me how my numbers are doing and how many tote bags I've sold and who I'm interviewing, and I feel very comfortable to talk to them about those elements of the podcast. We've done a good job or they've done a good job, honestly, of letting me air my grievances and speak very critically of the church. And they are able to still love me and accept me. <laughs> and that's how it should be, in my opinion. But I do feel lucky because I'm obviously speaking vocally, speaking vocally. I'm obviously speaking publicly in ways that are not... um I always say flattering, but I'm, you know, I'm saying I don't like the church and here's why. And they are still members of the church and they love the church in their own ways. I can't speak for them. But all of that to say that they let me do my thing and they let me have my own opinions and it doesn't affect their love and care for me, for which I am deeply, deeply grateful. And I am excited to have them on to kind of talk about what that's like for them and how they navigate that experience and what boundaries they've set themselves around how they're able to, you know, manage that and kind of differentiate that. So I think that'll be a really enlightening episode for me too, to hear more about their thoughts and feelings around it all and what it's like for them. Okay, that is all for today. I feel like I could do that forever more. So many good questions. There's tons more I wanted to talk about that I didn't get to, but thank you for asking such wonderful, thought-provoking questions. Thank you for caring. Thank you for listening. I'm glad I could do this episode now because I know this is such an influencer thing to say, but there's a lot of new faces around here. The last time I kind of introduced myself and my story was about eight months ago. It was to less people, and it was also when I was in a different spot of life, of course. So it feels nice to kind of reintroduce myself in that way and talk through some thoughts and feelings around the podcast and around my spirituality and my story. I just can't wait to keep doing this with you all. 
there are fun things on the horizon as always, and I'm just excited, happy, grateful. I feel very honored, as I always say, to be able to do this and to be able to connect with you in this way. So thank you for being here. I'm so glad. I'm so grateful. I hope you have a fantastic week, and I can't wait to see you next Wednesday. Bye. G-I-R-S.